All right. Well, welcome, everybody. It, uh, it's a great pleasure that we have Ben Carpenter here today. Of course, uh, many of you know uh, him for his book and uh, something that uh, we've been enjoying hearing about uh, all morning today. I'm sure something that's going to be part of his talk this afternoon. You know, he was, of course, started his career as a banker and had uh, quite a career at that, but uh, has learned a lot of interesting things along the way about managing careers in life that, uh, that he talks about in his book and is going to be talking about today. So please welcome Ben Carpenter. Thank you, Eric. Um, we are going to have a fun time here for the next hour or so, and that's because we're going to be talking about issues that are most important to you all. But before I get to the specifics of those issues, I want to give you just a little bit of background about who I am and why I wrote this book. I spent the first nine years of my life living in a very nice town outside of Chicago, Lake Forest, Illinois. Uh, both my parents were from the area. It never occurred to me that I was going to work, or that I was going to live anywhere else. But one day, my parents called a family meeting of their five children at nine years old. I was the second oldest, and they told us that we were moving. And what had happened was my father had lost his job, and the job he had gotten was to be the plant manager for a small manufacturing firm in New Hampshire. What I didn't know at that time was that that was going to set the pattern for the next 10 years of my life until I went away to college. And every couple of years, my father would lose his job, and the family was forced to pack up and move often halfway across the country to wherever my father had gotten his next job. And my father didn't keep losing his job because he was unintelligent or not hardworking. My father was very intelligent, very hardworking, and he was very well educated. He had a undergraduate engineering degree and an MBA, both from Northwestern. What had happened was that my father made a fundamental mistake, and it was a mistake that he didn't correct for his entire career, and that is he chose the wrong job for himself. For whatever reason, my father early on decided that his path to success was to be a manager of people. Uh, but the problem with that was that my father was someone who had very little emotional ability to connect with people, and he was actually a very solitary man. And that meant that it was virtually impossible for him to be an effective manager. And he had a very unsuccessful business career that was very painful for him and, you know, over the years really destroyed his confidence. And it was, in fact, very difficult both emotionally and financially for the entire family. But to my father's great credit and my eternal gratitude, every time he got knocked down, he kept getting back up, he kept fighting for the family, and the result of that fight was that he was able to send all five of his children to college. And the college I went to is Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine, and I had a great four years there, both academically, athletically, socially, and importantly, romantically. I had a great time. <laughs> at Bowdoin College, and uh, when I left, I got a job at the Bankers Trust Company in New York City, and my job was to work out of the Empire State Building branch as a commercial lending officer, lending money to the finance industry, the rag trade, that's located in that area of Manhattan. And I did that job for two years, but at the end of that time, I realized that uh, I wanted a job that was had more excitement and the chance for greater compensation. And I was able to get myself transferred downtown into the Wall Street area uh, to the Bankers Trust trading floor. And for the next three years, I was a treasury bond salesman for Bankers Trust. And that job was everything I hoped it would be. The markets were exciting. I loved the atmosphere on the trading floor. And the, uh, 
there was a chance for more compensation. Uh, after three years of doing that job, I got a job at Morgan Stanley. I did that for one year, and then I got a job at a small bond trading firm in Greenwich, Connecticut called Greenwich Capital, and I was to stay there for 20 years. When I got to Greenwich, I was a salesman, then I was a trader, then I was a sales manager, co-chief operating officer, and finally the co-CEO. And Greenwich Capital wasn't just a great experience for me, it was a great experience for almost everybody that ever worked there. Uh, when I joined the firm, we were 75 people. When I left, we were over 1,200 people. When I got there, we were an insignificant factor on Wall Street. Uh, when I left, we were ranked number one in two major business lines on Wall Street, buying and selling of U.S. Treasury bonds and the buying and selling of asset bonds with customers. And finally, Greenwich Capital was very profitable. For the seven years I was the co-CEO, we were three times more profitable per employee than Goldman Sachs, and historically, Goldman Sachs is the most profitable firm on Wall Street. What I haven't talked about yet is my family. I did say that I had a great time romantically at Bowdoin. That's because I met my wife there, Lee, who's in the back of the room. What, what happened was, uh, I was a sophomore, she was a freshman, and Lee had been on campus for all of two days. And I saw her across the room at a fraternity party, and something came over me that's never happened before or since. I pushed my way through the crowd, and when I got to her, I literally grabbed the boy she was talking to and threw him aside. And he, he happened to be my best friend. And that was the best timed and most important act of aggression I ever perpetrated <laughs> upon anybody in my life because eight years later we were married. We've been married for 29 years now. We have three daughters, Avery, Kendall, and Cameron. Cameron was a freshman at the uh, Arts and Sciences, but this book, The Bigs, was written for my eldest daughter, Avery, who graduated from Vanderbilt in 2011. And unlike you all, she hadn't done any thinking about what she might want to do with her career uh, post-graduation, and so she landed back home with an English degree and no idea whatsoever what she was going to do with it. And so for the next nine months, she did some things that were kind of worthwhile, some things that were kind of not worthwhile. Lee and I were starting to get pretty, pretty worried about this, but then Avery did something that was very smart and she sort of took stock of herself and thought about what it is that she had always liked to do, which was acting. She had always wanted to be an actress, but we know that's a tough, tough road to go down. But what she was always very good at was writing. And so Avery thought that maybe she could combine those two things, what she, what she liked and most importantly what she was good at, for a career in television production, or a job at least in television production. And after a you know, lengthy job search, she got a job offer. And it was to be the assistant of the co-executive producer of the Katie Couric Show on ABC. And when Avery got this job offer, she was living at home, and the co-executive producer called her up personally and said, you know, you're, you're gonna be working with me, but the co-executive producer said one thing that was very important. She said, uh, I need you there Monday morning. And the reason is that this show was going to launch for the very first time in just a few weeks. So when Avery set down the phone, told Lee and I the good news, you know, we were jumping up and down. You would have thought it was New Year's Eve at the Carpenter House because we knew this was a great job and we knew Avery was going to be great at it. And that feeling of euphoria lasted until the next day when Avery sent Lee and I an email titled, uh, subject, is this okay to send? And it was addressed to her new boss. And it was very short. You know, I can't wait to work with, thanks for the job, can't wait to work with you. But would you mind if I didn't start work on Monday? I'd like to start work a week from Monday because I have some loose ends to tie up. And being Avery's father, I knew just what those loose ends were. Avery was sick and tired of living at home with mom and dad. And she, now that she had a job, she wanted to go into New York City and start apartment hunting. And so when I read this email, my heart started pounding 
It felt like it was going to jump out of my chest, and it felt like my head was going to explode. And it wasn't because I was mad at Avery. I wasn't mad at her at all. I was scared for her. I was scared because I realized for the first time that this daughter of mine, who was so well-educated, smart, and in some ways sort of sophisticated, had no idea about what the real world was about to demand of her. And so in an absolute panic, I sent her an email, do not send, more to follow. And I sat down and furiously typed out 22 bullet points on my phone about everything <laughs> that I thought that Avery needed to know to be able to survive and succeed in the real world. And as testament to just how anxious and worried I was about this, I didn't stop at 22 bullet points. I kept writing for the next 18 months, and the result is this book that you have and is behind me. Um, the book has maybe the longest title in the history of publishing. <laughs> <laughs> the Bigs, The Secrets Nobody Tells Students and Young Professionals About How to Choose a Career, Get a Great Job, Do a Great Job, Be a Leader, Start a Business, Manage Your Money, Stay Out of Trouble, and Live a Happy Life. <laughs> now, that's a mouthful. And I didn't start out thinking that I was going to write about all those issues. Uh, but what happened was, as I started to write, I realized that these were the topics that I thought Avery needed to know, and what Avery's sisters needed to know, and importantly, what I wished I had known as I was just starting out in my, you know, as a student and as a young professional. <coughs> so, before we get to the second half of this, which is the most important part, which is the question and answer, I want to just jog through those eight bullet points on the cover, hitting some of the, some of the highlights. Uh, first, on how to choose a career, I think the important thing to understand is that the classic, the typical advice that you hear everywhere is often very bad advice. And the advice that you'll hear about choosing a career is do what you like, follow your passion. Now, if what you like to do and what you're good at are one and the same, then there's no conflict. Full speed ahead, go for it. But if, like most people, what you like to do or passionate about is different than what you're good at, then I would argue that you should seriously consider doing what you're good at for your career and what you're passionate about for a hobby. Why is that? Well, because the working world is too competitive to try to make a living doing something that you're not good at, that you don't have a talent for. And I feel so strongly about this because of you know, personal experiences. First, with my father, who tried to make a career out of doing something that he wasn't good at, and it had, honestly, disastrous results. Um, the opposite was my daughter, Avery, who's only been out of Vanderbilt for three and a half years, but she did great at the Katie Couric Show, and she now writes for a, uh, uh, for a magazine, for a, for a daily newsletter called The Skin. And, uh, and she's doing great, and she, she, loves her, she loves her, loves her life, loves her career. Uh, the other example is from my own career. Uh, when I had been at Greenwich Capital for two years, uh, the head of the company, the founder of the company, uh, one day came by my desk and said he'd like to buy me a hamburger after, after work. I said, great. And uh, over that meal, uh, his name was Ted Netzker, he, uh, he explained that, that, I, that he thought I had been doing a, a really good job selling, and he wanted to uh, further uh, leverage my talents by making me a trader at the firm. And Ted was somebody that I always liked and admired greatly, and I thought this was just another stroke of genius on Ted's part. Because uh, even though my Wall Street career to date had been all in sales, I had always wanted to be a trader. And having been on Wall Street for six years or so, I knew I was going to be a great trader. And so I just couldn't wait. So when Ted suggested this, I said, thank you so much. I can't wait. That's great. And I accepted the job. And for the next two years, I proved myself to be maybe one of the worst traders <laughs> in the history of Wall Street. Now, I didn't lose the most money in the history of Wall Street, and uh, that's because I was a junior trader with junior trading limits, but I just couldn't make any money. And uh, at the end of two years, it was pretty obvious to everyone 
that I needed to do something different with my career. And as I, as I thought about it, the one thing that I knew I didn't want to do was to go back to sales. Because I had already been there, done that, and I didn't want to go back to my old job as a failure. I was open-minded to doing anything else. And, uh, you know, there were some other things going on in my life at the time, but, you know, I had told Ted that I was going to think about the job offer and, uh, and, 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 and uh, what, what Ted did was he called me into his office and he said <laughs> what he'd like to do is to make me the chief financial officer of the company. And that was one of the top five officials at the company and I thought this was the greatest example of shaving upwards I had ever seen in my life. And so, you know, but because it was such a shock to me, I, I said, you know, that I'd like to that I'd like to think about this job offer, and I didn't want to accept it right away. And so, uh, I did think about it for four weeks. And I, when I went back to Ted, I told him that uh, I didn't want to be the CFO. I thanked him for the job offer, but I said I didn't want to be the CFO. What I wanted to do was to go back to sales. Exactly the opposite, exactly the thing that I had said to myself a few weeks before that I didn't want to do. And, you know, why did I do that? Because when I really sat down and thought about it, I realized that what I needed to do for my own happiness and sense of satisfaction after not helping the company win and succeed for the prior two years, I needed to get back to doing something that I was good at. And so I did go back into sales. I went back with a renewed commitment, appreciation for doing something I was good at, and a renewed commitment to make a success out of, out of this. And uh, I did that, and I rode that success to become the sales manager, co-chief operating officer, and finally the co-CEO. And I think the important part of the story is that I am convinced that if I had taken Ted up on his job to make me the CFO, I would have never become the CEO. And that's because I wouldn't have been playing to my strengths in being able to lead by example. I might have been a reasonably competent CFO, but I wouldn't have been doing what I was really good at, which was selling. <coughs> so that's why I feel it's so important to do what you're good at for your career. Uh, how to get a great job? You know, most of you will know most of this already, but I'll just jog through it which is, to me, the most important part is informational interviews. And, uh, you know, everybody knows what job interviews are. Informational interviews are just another way of networking. And in my career, when young people have come to me for informational interviews, the first thing I do is tell them congratulations for understanding that it's important and for getting, it, getting into my office. Then I ask them, how many are they planning on doing? And typically, what I hear back is, you know, 40 to 50. You know, excuse me, I just five to ten. What I tell them is they should be doing 40 to 50 informational interviews. And they're always surprised by that and shocked. But if you do that many informational interviews, three things happen. One, you understand whether the job that you think you want is in fact the job you really want. Or if you're in finance, you understand what piece of that complex business you, you're going to be involved in, or you're best involved in. Uh, you also get experience uh, interviewing, which you don't get in college, and it's important to have that experience. The third one is where the informational interviews and the job interviews come together. And I think of it like catching fish. You know, if you're a commercial fisherman, you want to catch a lot of fish, you have a lot of lines in the water. Well, if you're out there talking to people for informational interviews, even if there's not a job involved, it's amazing how often those informational interviews can, one way or another, can lead to a job interview and finally a job. Uh, the other piece about getting a great job that I think is important for young people to understand is that the first sales job you have isn't to sell the company that you're the best person for that job. The first sales job you have is to sell yourself that you're the best person for that job. And if you can sell yourself that you're the best person for that job, then in the interview, all you need to do is to go in and tell the truth. And the truth is that you believe you are the best person for that job. And the only way that you can convince yourself that you're the best person for the job is to really understand what the job is. And the only way to understand what the job is goes back to informational interviews. And that's why I think informational interviews 
are the foundation for every successful job search. How to do a great job. Uh, obviously, there's so many aspects of this, and I'm gonna only gonna talk about one. And it's, uh, it's an aspect that senior employees, most senior employees don't understand just as well as most junior employees don't understand. And that is, if you wanna be an outstanding employee, one great way to do that is to think like a CEO. Now, what does every CEO in the world try to accomplish? There's only two things, but, he's, but he or she are trying to do that every single day. And those two things are, they're trying to either reduce expenses and or raise revenues. That's it. Now, that could be in the short term, that could be in the intermediate term, that could be the long term, but that's what they're trying to do. And as an employee, you can help with that. It can be as simple as and small as going to the head of the mail room and explaining why they should buy a different pen because it's better and cheaper than the one they currently buy. Or it can be as big as sitting down and making an appointment with the CFO and the CEO about why the company should enter a new business line and invest millions of dollars. And it can be everything in between that. But in my experience, junior employees come in and they have a box this big and they try to do that box that big. Senior employees come in and they try to do their job that's this big, box is this big. Very few raise up their eyes and try to understand what the, comp what the company is trying to accomplish, which is lowering expenses and raising revenues. And so if you do that proactively, uh, it's amazing how quickly you will be identified as a outstanding employee. How to be a leader, uh, the important thing for young people to understand about being a leader is you can be a leader from your very first day at work. Now, how can that be? Well, that's because the foundation for all leadership is to lead by example. And you don't have to have a senior job and you don't have to have people reporting to you to lead by example. Uh, to lead by example isn't easy, but it's not complicated. You get to work early, you ask good questions, and you look for ways to help everybody else and the company succeed. And if you do that aggressively from the first day right on through your career, you'll be amazed at how quickly you're identified as a leader. And I also think it's important for young people to understand that many people believe that leadership is an innate quality that you either have or don't have. I don't happen to believe that, but a lot of people do. And so you don't want people to form an opinion of you as maybe a valuable employee but not a leader. You want them from day one to think of you as a leader. And you can do that simply by leading by example. And you, again, you can do that first day on the job. Uh, how to start a business? Again, too many things to, too many issues to, to go into uh, here, but I'm gonna talk about just one of them. Every, uh, every business started with a great idea. And it would be a great idea for a new uh, product or service or the way to provide an existing product or service better or cheaper. And in my life, I haven't had that many good ideas, but I've had a few, uh, one of which wasn't exactly an entrepreneurial venture, but it did start a new organization, and that's when I saw my wife across the fraternity room and <laughs> ran over to her. That was a good idea, and I did something about it. Uh, another idea was when I graduated from Bowdoin College in 1980, and moved to New York, and there was only two things I was trying to do at that point. I wanted to learn how to be a banker, and I wanted to keep having fun. And as part of that second, second part of that equation, uh, I was asked to play on a softball team uh, for a local bar that was very popular with young professionals. And I remember going back to the bar after a game. I had my jersey on, I had a beer in one hand. I remember exactly where I was in the bar at the time, when I had this thought, looking around, I said, I can do this. I can get these people and their friends to come to my bar. The only problem was I didn't have a bar and I didn't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> but the next day, I come, came home from work from, from Bankers Trust. I changed out of my suit and tie, put on t-shirts, jeans, and sneakers, and I went around the neighborhood looking for a bar that looked like it could use some customers. And the first place 
I got to that looked promising. It's a place I had never seen before. Uh, uh, but the name of the bar was the Tumble Inn. As I say in the book, it was the most beat up, run down, forlorn looking bar on the east side, and it didn't get any better. When I walked in, uh, you know, when I did walk in, there was two old guys looking like they were about to fall off of their bar stools, and there was one old white haired lady behind the bar. Uh, and I kept going back to the bar over the next couple of weeks. I came to realize that she was the owner of the bar, and she told me that she had a seven year lease on it, and I made a proposition to her, which was to be partners, and that the waterfall for revenue would be we'd first pay all the bills of the bar, then we'd pay her a salary, more than she was making currently, and after that, we'd split everything 50-50. Uh, that's what she agreed to. Uh, the first thing I did was basically take out all the furniture in the bar, put a DJ in the back, put a big screen TV, which in those days was as deep as it was wide, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know that we had our ups and downs at the Tumble Inn, but it became one of the most successful, craziest bars uh, in New York for the next seven years until finally the lease came up and they tore it down in, in lieu of uh, putting up a high rise. Um, the last idea that I want to just mention is this book. And, uh, and also, when you're talking about the, the bar, I think actually one of the most interesting things about it is that a lot of people, that's a lifelong dream of theirs. Boy, I'd like to own a bar. I, I never, it never occurred to me to own a bar. I mean, literally, I like to go to bars, but the idea that I would own a bar just absolutely never occurred to me. Uh, the other idea is this, uh, the book, the bids. Um, a lot of people think that writing a book is one of the things that they want to do in their life. For me, I never, it never occurred to me that, that I'd write a book, that I really had something unique to say about something, and so it never occurred to me. But Avery sent me that crazy email that set off a chain reaction, and the result was this book. And so uh, what, what, what I, the main point that I want to make is that good ideas are rare and they're precious. And when you get a good idea, you can't let it just walk out the door. When you get a good idea, you got to wrap your arms around it, find out if it's an actionable idea, and if it is, have the confidence to do something about it. Uh, managing your money. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, what I want to what I want to what I want to tell you is that almost every successful person I know across all ages, and you guys are all going to be successful people, or already are, uh, spend way too much time worrying about how much money they make and not enough time worrying about how much money they spend. And that's wrong for a whole bunch of reasons, but there's one real simple one, uh, which is the old Ben Franklin, a penny saved is a penny earned. You know, for the discussion, we'll inflate that to a dollar saved is a dollar earned. Uh, in Ben Franklin's day, that was true. Today, with federal and state taxes, a dollar earned is closer to 50 cents. <laughs> <laughs> a dollar saved is a dollar. So just on that basis alone, you should spend more time uh, worrying about how much you spend rather than how much you make. The other thing I will tell you is that uh, in your life, you should spend much more time worrying about things you can control and not things you can't control. And how much money you make is not in your control. If you're an employee, it's how, how what your boss thinks about you, how the company's doing. If you're the owner, it's what the market for your goods and services are. And that's gonna wax and wane over time. So the one thing you do control is your spending and you should spend more time worrying about that. Uh, how to stay out of trouble. There's two parts of how to stay out of trouble. The first one was what was said to me on my first day at work at Greenwich Capital. My boss pulled me aside and he said, Ben, don't ever do anything that you don't want to see on the front page of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Now, my boss didn't make that up, but it is extraordinarily good advice. And if during your career you have to ask yourself whether something that you're contemplating doing is morally or legally correct, well, right there, that's an alarm bell going off. <laughs> but after you, you know, after you think about that, then think about testing against, do I want to see this on the front page of the papers? And if you don't want to see it on the front page of the papers, then you probably shouldn't do it. 
But I will tell you that that sort of a situation will come up less than a handful of times probably in your working career. Uh, what will come up every single day of your working career is how to stay out of trouble at the company that you work at, even if it's your own company. And the way you do that is to follow what I call the golden rule for employees. And the golden rule for employees is to never say anything negative about any of your coworkers ever. Now, we're human beings. That's an impossible standard to live up to. And in my career, I didn't always live up to it. And I tell the story in the book about once when I didn't live up to it, and it came this close to derailing my career. And because I was a senior person at Greenwich Capital at that point, it came this close to doing serious damage to the firm. And so how do you avoid this? You know, in practical terms, you know, what I would suggest is that if you're in the lunch line or around the water cooler and people are talking ill about a coworker, just remove yourself from the situation. If you're put on the spot and said, somebody says, you know, don't you hate Billy or Susie? Just say, even if you know them, just say, I don't know them very well. If you have a problem with a, with a coworker, talk to them about it, but absolutely nothing good will come out of talking about them behind their backs. The finally, the, the, the last bullet point is the most important one, which is living a happy life. And uh, the secret to living a happy life is to understand that happiness is a choice. And this is something that I didn't know wasn't explained to me in a way that I understood until I was 40 years old. But when I say happiness is a choice, that doesn't mean that you wake up in the morning and you put a smiley face mask on, grinning from ear to ear. That's delusional. That's not happiness. <laughs> but you can raise your average amount of happiness significantly if you shorten the amount of time that you allow yourself to be upset about something. And so every single day, you know, there's things that in your life, in my life, will annoy you, make you angry, agitated, some, sometimes in a very serious way, sometimes in a very insignificant way. And before I came to understand that happiness was a choice, I would just let Mother Nature take its course. And, you know, over time, I'd become less angry or agitated about whatever had happened. And sometimes that would take me, you know, a half an hour, an hour, a day, a month, a year, whatever it was for that topic, you know, eventually I would, it would get over it. But what, what's happened once I understood that happiness was a choice is the instant that I have this, you know, unhappiness or this sense of anger about something that happened, the next thought that comes into my mind is I'm losing. And I'm losing because I, my value system is I want to be happy. And so I immediately do what I call hitting my emotional reset button and I concentrate on getting over it and moving on. And things that used to take me, you know, an hour or two or more, often I can get over in 15 seconds or 30 seconds by just having the mental discipline to committing myself to not allowing myself to uh, wallow in this unhappiness. And it's really been uh, transformational for me. And I think that it's Im important to understand that there's a lot of, there's nothing that I'm telling you, like informational interviews or saving money or whatever that stuff is that you're going to do right now. But choosing to be happy, saying, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try that. The next time I'm unhappy, I'm going to try to shorten that time period up. And what I will tell you is that, you know, some of you may go, well, you know what, that's fine. I'm perfectly happy. That's not really an issue. Why I'm, at, why I'm at Owen and why I'm sitting here listening to this old guy talk is I, I have an interest in being successful professionally. Well, I will tell you that there's no better way to, be, to increase your likelihood of being successful professionally than to raise your average level of happiness. And that's because happiness is like a magnet. People want to work with and for happy people. And unhappiness is like a repellent. People don't want to work with or for unhappy people. So if all you care about, to me, being happy is the 
is the high, my highest goal. But if that's not on your, uh, at the top of your list and being successful professionally is, understand that there's probably nothing you can do to increase your chances of professional success than raising, raising your happiness up. So that's it for my prepared remarks, and I'd love to have any questions from anybody about any of these topics or anything else on your mind. Yes? I have one from an advice perspective. I was um, recently asked by someone to put them in touch with someone that I used to work with really closely, and he, when we worked together, we worked really closely, and she always said, let me know if you need anything, and I said that I would put them in touch, and then in thinking about it, we had been out of touch for like two years. So I didn't really feel comfortable reaching out to her. And you've obviously developed like a really great network of contacts. And I was wondering if you've ever had a general rule that is like too far out of touch to ask a favor. And when you do try and reach out to these people that you used to be closer with, that you used to work with more closely, how you kind of like quickly develop, redevelop that relationship? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I, I, I would personally have no compunction about that at all. You know, I mean, to me, as I say, you know, if. For instance, if you want to apply for a job and you want to get your resume to the top of the pile, you know, you have to get, unless your resume is just Star Wars, you have to get somebody inside that company to put in a good word for you. Um, so you got to network. But if you can't find anybody in your network, then what you need to do is through LinkedIn, you got to go find somebody at that company, send them a note, have a conversation with them, and ask them to do it. So, you know, and. So that's obviously a much more distant relationship than somebody you were used to work with a few years ago. Um, so I would say that I couldn't imagine a time period, even if you told me it was decades ago, call up the person and you know say, you know, Bobby or Susie, you know, I, I, I haven't talked to you in a long time, but I've got it at home. Just send an email. I'd love to have a quick chat with you. Could we talk? You know, you'd be amazing. You'd be amazed by how how uh, open people generally will be. And the best way to test this is to say, how would you feel if it was reversed? And the person called up and said, you know, would you be, you might or might not do the favor, depending on what it was, but you wouldn't be put off by the fact that you were, that you were asked for it. Which really goes to the whole, to broaden it out to this whole informational interview. And I know you guys are sort of beyond this, but when I talk to in, uh, undergraduates, they're so worried about asking and being rejected. And what I always do, I'm not going to do it with you all, but what I always do is I say, okay, let's just pretend that you're all out in the working world five years from now, and somebody from Vanderbilt sends you a, a short email asking for 20 minutes of your time in person on the phone. How many of you would you know, say yes? Well, every hand in the room goes up. Well, I said, well, there you go. And it's even easier for experienced professionals because they, even more than students, understand that nothing they accomplished was on their own. It was all on the back of people helping them accomplish it. And so people actually like to be asked for favors. And you know, there's, there's, there's sort of a, uh, something that I, that I had heard recently that, that was interesting, that if you really want to form a bond with somebody, you don't give them something, you ask them for something which you know, I, I think I might have heard a long time ago, but I just was reminded of it recently, and I think that also relates to that. You know, people like to be able to, to help you even more than they like to be helped. Who else has a question? Yes? So it seems like you've been very successful in your sales career, and you've most, you mentioned that the first thing you have to do is sell yourself on whatever you're selling. So other than that, are there any things that really move the needle for you in terms of your sales ability? Yeah, um, I would say that the single most important character trait that I've seen in successful salespeople, and I've seen a lot of them, is an unwillingness to lose. You know, a focus on, on you know, I keep the eye on the prize and just go, I'm not going to lose. You know, which is part of resilience. You know, it doesn't matter what, what sort of uh, uh, obstacles you accomplish. You know, I am going to do this, and I'm going to do an exceptionally good job of it, and I'm going to use my creativity, uh, I'm going to use my networking, I'm going to use every being of my fiber, everything I got, intelligence, hard work, determination, resilience, I'm going to, put the, I'm going to pour it all in there, and, and that's, what's, that's what's going to make me successful. And, you know, those are the people that, and, and you can get that, you know, it's sort of that, 
that fuel can come from a lot of different places to do that, that unwillingness to lose. For me, it came from fear. You know, I never felt I was good enough, which is pretty typical for a lot of people, but I always felt, even more importantly, that, you know, my father was really the smartest, nicest guy I knew, and he had an unsuccessful business career, and I didn't really understand why for a long time. And, uh, you know, so I always felt that if my father couldn't have a successful business career, how was I ever going to? And so that sort of insecurity and fear is what sort of drove me to do whatever it took in whatever role or job uh, I was trying to do to, to not be willing to lose. And that's the number one thing. Yes? I guess you kind of just, you talked about discerning what you're good at and what you like doing. What would you find was the most useful tool in, in that discernment process? Was it taking that month and looking introspectively or was it, you know, talking with mentors, family members, friends? How did you kind of go through that process? Well, for, for me, it was, there was a lot of things that went into it and I had some, I had, I had a health episode during that time that sort of crystallized my understanding about, about what it is that was important to me. But I think that, that for, for young people, and again, you guys are, you guys are, above, you know, well above the undergraduate level. But what I say to them is that there's no one right answer and sort of go to a, a an arsenal, which is, you know, I just re recently, literally a few weeks ago, took the Myers-Briggs and the Strong Career Test for the first time. And, you know, I found that to be, you know, worthwhile. Now, what the, what the Strong Test, which is, which is tells you specifically what you, Ben Carpenter, should do for your career, or, you know, could you consider? My number one thing was that they said I should be a parks and recreation manager. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I, I know how they got there because I, you know, the managing is, is kind of obvious, but the, uh, and I like to be outdoors, and so that's what they thought made sense for me. <laughs> now, I know that that wouldn't have been a good job for me. It wouldn't have been exciting enough, and it wouldn't have had enough compensation. But, <laughs> but the fact of having to think about that and then reject it for some reason is, is as valuable as getting getting the, the right answer, if you will. Um, so what I think you have to do is, uh, you know, I think things like that are great. Uh, I think that talking to senior people who know you, you know, seasoned business professionals in any business that know you and care about you, uh, but understand business in general, asking them, hey, what do you think, you know, you sort of understand what I like and what, what, what do you think I should do? I think that's valuable. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, this is just one of those things that's an imperfect science and you can't outsource it to anybody else. At the end of the day, you're going to own it yourself and you got to take stock, look in the mirror and, and say, what am I, what, what, what's the right thing for me? And I think it's important to understand that you're probably not going to get it right the first time. I didn't get it right the first time. Very few people get it right the first time. And, you know, so then they'll adjust. But I will say, the closer you can get to the bullseye each time, the better chance you have of, of ultimately hitting it. So um, that's the process I think you need to go through. Yes? So we talked about Lincoln's concept, but how do you weigh the um, not wanting to give up with realizing maybe I'm on a career path that I'm not good at, maybe I'm going to make a transition to something I'm better at? Yeah. Um, I, I think that goes to the if, if you, I think one way, if you look above you at a company and you go, do I want to be my boss or my boss's boss? If the answer is yes, but you're having a tough time getting through it, I'd say, you know, probably you ought to gut it out and, and figure it out. But if you look above you and you go, I don't want to be those people, then you're probably at the wrong either company industry or, or job. And so you ought, to, you ought to make a move. And one of the things that I do say is that I think that that while you're on the job, you need to be very selfless if you want to be a leader. You got to put everybody else, the company and all other employees ahead of yourself. But as you're thinking about where you work, you have to be totally ruthless. You have to be, you cannot spend a day at a company that you shouldn't be at because time's a wasted and you want to get on the right, on the right track. And so, um, so that's sort of a, the way that I would look at it. All right, well, thank you.
Ben, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us today and sharing some wisdom from uh, some well-earned lessons of life. So, thank you very much. or have some business cards. People want their books signed, I'm happy to do that, whatever. So, but thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.